Good afternoon, and welcome to Community Conversations for the reopening of the 2020-2021 school year for Baltimore County Public Schools. My name is Billy Burke, and I'm the Chief of Organizational Effectiveness. I'm so grateful that you joined us today and that you continue to remain active and interested in what's happening in Baltimore County Public Schools. I'd like to thank you for completing the survey that provided the questions for today's program and know that at the end of the program, we will also take live questions uh, and uh, community superintendents will spend some time answering those live questions as well. It's gonna be an exciting day full of information. Thank you again for joining us. At this point, I'd like the community superintendents to introduce themselves. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Christina Byers, and I'm the community superintendent for the Central Zone. I'm fortunate to have spent my uh, entire teaching and uh, educational career in Baltimore County Public Schools as a teacher, a school-based administrator, um, someone who had the opportunity to work in professional learning and in curriculum and instruction. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon, and we appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend this afternoon with us. Now my colleague, Dr. Roberts, will introduce himself. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us on this afternoon of community conversations around reopening for the 2020-2021 school year in Team BCPS. Um, my name is Dr. George Roberts, and I have the fortunate pleasure of beginning my 17th year here in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, through my journey in Baltimore County Public Schools, I've had the pleasure of being an administrator um, throughout the county, at Delaney High School, Woodlawn High School, Golden Ring Middle School, and Perry Hall High School before serving in various central office positions and now um, going into my fifth year um, as community superintendent for East Zone Schools. I'm also very fortunate that all three of my daughters um, have um, participated and, and gone to Baltimore County Public Schools with my youngest beginning her high school career here in Baltimore County Public Schools. So certainly um, invested um, in our community and in our school system and, and very fortunate to be with all of you here this afternoon. So thank you for joining us. Uh, so at this time, I'll introduce our colleague or my colleague and our colleague, Dr. Raquel Jones, Community Superintendent for the West Zone Schools. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. My name again is Raquel Jones, and I am the proud community superintendent of the West Zone. I've had the fortunate opportunity to be a principal and an assistant principal at the elementary school level, and then also a principal at the middle school level. I also have um, two wonderful children, one who is in college and has matriculated through high school, but then I do have a, a daughter who is um, becoming a sophomore and also experiencing virtual um, instruction this school year. So first and foremost, we we all hope that you all and your families are weathering this crisis as best as you can. All three of us are parents and we know that you have concerns about your children, your jobs and your health. And we know it can be overwhelming. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is still very much with us. Cases in Baltimore County continue to increase and it is more important than ever that we as a community follow health and safety guidance by maintaining six feet of social distance, wearing a face covering to protect ourselves and others, and washing our hands as often as possible. Staying home whenever possible, and of course, if you feel sick, the best place to stay is at home. Now we'll move to Ms. Christina Byers as we continue our community conversation. Thank you, Dr. Jones. So as you know, due to the spread of the virus, our school year is going to begin with virtual learning. Our first day of school is still Tuesday, September 8th, and virtual learning is currently planned through the end of the first semester, which ends on January 29th, 2021. As much as we would all love to welcome our students and our staff back to our school buildings, our top priority is health and safety. We are also being responsive to our community. We received about 52,000 responses to our reopening survey, as well as much guidance from 16 advisory groups and experts on health and education. 
Our reopening plan, which has been posted on our website, is grounded in compassion to provide high quality teaching and learning, social emotional learning, equity, and additional supports and resources. From December 1st through the 15th, our current plan is for families to choose a learning model for the second semester to begin on February 1st and continue through June, if safe to do so. The options at that time will be a hybrid learning model with some in-person days and virtual learning or to continue with an all virtual model. At this point, Dr. Roberts is going to share more information about our virtual model that will begin this fall. Thank you, Ms. Spires. So uh, several of the questions that we received um, over the past week through the survey in preparation for this presentation was really just asking about how will it look? How will our virtual learning environment look in elementary school and middle school and high school and all that that encompasses whether it be from the actual virtual meeting bell schedule all the way through what will actually be going on within those chunks of time within the virtual learning experience so this is a graphic representation of how the time will be structured within the day for your child um, throughout the day there so from elementary or middle school or high school these components that you see here in this pie um, really make up um, the make up what's going to be done um, for our students as they uh, participate at the elementary level um, where you see movement breaks but as we go up through middle and high school um, the focus more on other areas of independent work small group work so um, what we learned from our emergency closures in the spring and what in feedback that we've gathered from the community since our emergency closure in the spring was an opportunity to provide more live instruction more rigor in that instruction and then more interaction um, with the teacher during that instruction. So these pieces of the pie, these six pieces, really are what make up these components around live instruction, more rigorous instruction, and more interaction. So at this time, you're, you should have received from your school your child's schedule, which includes live instruction, small group learning, independent work, and opportunities for additional supports. But also critical and extremely critical in this process How is the social emotional component good. of this. So social good. emotional good. learning good. is also part good. of the school good. day through community building and strategies that support students and staff well-being, mental health, and overall wellness. So virtual instruction will be provided Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, Wednesdays. Wednesdays will be reserved for the targeted student intervention as well as teacher professional learning and meetings. We want to reassure families that the students who are eligible for services through special education, advanced academics, and English for speakers of other languages will receive those services throughout virtual learning. And those services will be unpacked a little bit in more detail as we move through um, this portion um, of our presentation and reflecting on questions that were received from the community. So at this time, um, Dr. Jones will walk you through the next step in the process. Thank you. It is important that we all get ready for the launch of the 2020 school year and to help prepare families for virtual learning, schools will be offering outdoor pickup for devices, hotspots, and instructional materials. We know that families are eager to pick up a device and hotspot for internet access. Your child's school has a list of students who have not re yet received a device. And please note that dates and times will be determined by each school. So look out for that information. In addition, preschool and pre-K students will receive paper materials by mail for each three or four week unit. And more information is to come around that. We are finalizing the process for provided expanded coverage of student meals for our communities. The process for enrolling students and providing documentation for both shared domicile and residency ver verification for rising sixth and ninth graders is available online. Just go to www.bcps.com Dot org. There is ongoing support for families through counselors and PPW or people personnel workers as it relates to enrollment and other school reopening issues. So we want to make sure you all know that as you get ready, we're here to support you through that. Another important uh, piece of information that has come up is around technology. And this slide basically talks about the three categories on where several questions came up. 
access to student devices, hotspots and internet service, and technology or technological support. As mentioned, schools will distribute devices based on their list of those students who have already received a device. The pickup times will be coordinated with pickup of instructional materials by your child's school. For students needing internet access, families should inform the school to receive a hotspot. To help families use Schoology, which is another question that came up, we do have information available on our website. Again, go to www.bcps.org and then click Support for Families to reach our parent university. Then click Schoology Support. Again, that's www.bcps.org. Click Support for Families to reach out to our parent university, then skip, click Schoology Support. At Parent University, you'll also find the link to tech support. That's for parents, guardians, and students. Families speaking languages other than English can also click on their language from the homepage and find translate, translated resources. At this time, Ms. Byers will continue the conversations around question that, questions that came up for special education services. Ms. Byers? Ms. Byers, you're muted. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Um, many, many of you did ask questions around special education when completing the survey that led up to this community conversation. We are going to spend some time this afternoon unpacking some of the questions that we received through the survey. But please know that Baltimore County Public Schools is going to continue to work with our Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, or CCAC, to have ongoing discussions around um, how we will provide students uh, who receive special education services with those services in a virtual environment. The supports and services that are outlined in a student's individualized education plan, or IEP, are going to be provided to the greatest extent possible, as stated by the Maryland State Department of Education in a virtual setting. Teachers and our related service providers are going to collaborate and communicate with families to address each student's individual needs. Many of your questions were um, involved the IEP team process, and so I want to take a little bit of time to unpack that. IEP teams will meet according to their annual schedule or as they are requested by families or schools. Interim IEP team meetings can be held at any time throughout the school year to address the needs of students within the IEP document. Those meetings will continue to be held virtually at this time. Revaluation meetings will be based on adequate data collection and the availability and use of virtual and online evaluation tools to complete assessments for data collection. We also received many questions around one-on-one -on -one assistance for students. Students in need of additional adult assistance for support, either in academic or behavioral learning, will be identified on their IEP. The time and the services will be outlined within the actual individual education program. These supports and services are related to the needs in a virtual education setting and will be provided virtually at this time. With the use of our educators and our adult assistants, our district will incorporate the support staff within the instructional and independent student activities that students experience as part of virtual education. So as you are aware, parts of the student stay will be synchronous and parts of the student stay will be asynchronous. And we will um, be utilizing our paraeducators and our adult assistants in both of those capacities. Teachers and our related service providers can work collaboratively with the use of paraeducators to support our students and their families. They will work collaboratively to uh, implement those allowable accommodations 
um, that are part of a student's IEP or 504 plan to best meet the student's needs. And as a team, we will work together on those instructional and behavioral strategies to maintain students' engagement in both uh, live stream lessons and independent activities. The last category we'd like to unpack this afternoon is the category of related service providers because many of you had questions regarding that. Our related service providers, meaning our speech language pathologists, our occupational therapists, our physical therapists, those providers, teachers, and support staff will continue to collaborate with you, our families, to provide supports and implement all available technology that will enhance student learning. BCPS is implementing tools and applications that will support students in this process. Your related service providers will communicate with you through email and provide you with written directions on how you can implement exercises within uh, your home. Additionally, we will also uh, do so in a way that maintains the health and safety of our students and staff during virtual instruction throughout this ongoing pandemic. At this time, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about early childhood education. We also received many questions for our youngest learners. And as a former elementary school principal, I know that uh, parents and families of our youngest learners have questions on what learning is going to look like for our three, four, and five-year-old students. So first, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about the gradual entry process. As um, some of you may know, if, you've, uh, if you have older students, Baltimore County Public Schools utilizes a gradual entry school process for our youngest learners, and we will continue to do so in a virtual environment. So between September 8th, and September 21st, our youngest learners, meaning our students who are three, four, and enrolled in uh, pre-K or kindergarten programs, will begin the school year in more of a one-on-one -on -one virtual or face-to-face -face environment with their teachers. So for our students who are in a three-year-old program or a four-year-old program, you should anticipate receiving specific communication from your school, specifically from your student's teacher around dates for those individual conferences. For pre-K students, those one-on-one -on -one conferences will begin on September 8th and they will be held through September 17th. And so again, there will be one-on-one -on -one conferences for families and teachers. Our instruction will begin on um, September 21st, where all students in pre-K will engage in those paper pathways. Gradual entry for kindergarten students will look very similar in that you will um, be contacted uh, by your individual school through your individual teacher for one-on-one -on -one conferences that will be held between September 8th and September 14th. Beginning on September 17th, kindergarten students will begin to engage in those whole group opportunities as a class in a virtual setting. I do want to just spend a little bit of time unpacking what you can anticipate for early childhood learning for our youngest learners. Please know that virtual instruction has been designed for our youngest learners in a developmentally appropriate way. We are going to ensure that a student's day has a blend of, um, specifically for our kindergarten students, a blend of whole group instruction where they will have the opportunity to meet with their classmates. They will have an opportunity to engage in those class meetings with all of their classmates, but that they also will have opportunity to engage in much small group instruction. When we are in a brick and mortar setting, much of our early childhood education is delivered in a small group setting. And we will mimic those small groups in a virtual environment. So for part of the day, your student will be receiving their phonics instruction, their math instruction, 
with their teacher in a small group setting. They will have asynchronous independent activities to work through. But believe it or not, our youngest learners in a brick and mortar setting engage in independent activities all the time. We recognize that um, students in pre-K and kindergarten may have varying reading abilities. And so those asynchronous independent activities are truly customized and designed to allow students to engage independently. Um, it is always amazing to walk into a kindergarten class or a pre-kindergarten class and see how masterful our teachers are with ensuring that students are working on independent activities that are developmentally appropriate and can be done without teacher assistance. In a virtual setting, those activities will be designed in very much the same fashion. We also know that our youngest learners need movement and brain breaks. And when you receive that schedule from your uh, pre-K or kindergarten teacher, you will see all of those developmentally appropriate activities built into their schedule so that they will have opportunities for movement and play-based learning. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Jones, who will speak to what learning is going to look like for our students in grades one through five, because many of you had questions regarding their learning environment. Thank you. So as we explore what learning looks like in grades um, one through four and then even five, as our fifth graders begin to um, transition into um, our middle school years, a lot of questions came up around the elementary daily schedules. And in thinking about the elementary daily schedule, several questions came up just around the flexibility that was provided to schools. And as outlined in the BCPS reopening plan for fall 2020, schools were provided flexibility in creating a bell schedule that maximizes the learning of our elementary school students. As Ms. Byer stated, students will receive live instruction from teachers um, with a minimum of two hours and up to 3.5 hours at the elementary level, which includes um, guided practice, whole group instruction, and independent work. Scheduling considerations were made with the needs of students in mind. Um, our bell schedules within BCPS will begin no earlier than 8 a.m. and end no later than 4 p.m. We wanted to make sure that students were able and students and families were able to keep up with their routines and the bell schedules that were offered prior to the pandemic. Sample elementary schedules were used based on research and with the academic and social emotional learning needs of elementary school students in grades one through five. Keep in mind, the goal is to ensure that all schedules are grade level and grade appropriate. Time for literacy, math, social studies, and science, and special areas have been included to make sure that students receive a well-rounded curriculum. Questions came up around social emotional learning, and we'll get to that shortly, but social emotional learning opportunities and opportunities for students to connect virtually will also be included within the elementary school schedule and the elementary school instructional day. Um, included as well, students um, who receive any type of special education services, um, students with IEPs, ESOL, students who receive ESOL services, advanced academics, and any other supports that have been received as, as it relates to the instructional program. So the schedule will also provide opportunities for that. We got questions around, or we received questions, excuse me, around the daily schedule and attendance and how will attendance be taken. A BCPS teachers will take attendance using the BCPS student information system. Attendance is defined as presence and will be recorded for official reporting purposes and for the identification of additional student supports. Elementary school attendance is based on attendance at any point in the day and will be entered by the end of each duty day. Another area of questioning that was received was around instructional materials. Several parents and guardians and community stakeholders wanted to know what school supplies will students at the elementary level receive. Well, the good news is that schools will be providing essential learning materials. Um, and working with our Office of Curriculum and Instruction, elementary school students will receive open court workbooks and reading materials, Bridges math manipulatives and workbooks, Pearson math books, and other reading texts that do not necessarily have digital versions available. 
These materials will be disseminated to students on the instructional materials pickup day and individual schedules are being created for each school and will be communicated to families. So please look out for that information. Some schools will also be providing materials such as pencils, crayons, and notebooks and other items that are essential to students during our virtual learning experience. General guidance will be provided to parents and guardians from each school, again, regarding those materials that may be helpful to have at home. Schools will also provide parents and guardians with information on who to, who to contact and who to connect with virtually if additional assistance is needed with accessing with accessing and or the accessibility of instructional materials. Social emotional learning. We receive questions centered around counseling support and student well-being in a virtual learning and how students will stay connected and how will we make sure that all of our students are thriving and doing well in a virtual environment. Let's begin with counseling supports. Counselors will provide whole class asynchronous lessons for teachers to share with students and will conduct group and individual lessons. Parent permission will be obtained for individual and group um, sessions that are more targeted and your schools can provide information around that. Virtually school counselors will continue to provide academic information, transition to middle school for our fifth graders and social emotional support services within our virtual environment. Just to give you some indication of what a classroom counseling lesson will look and feel like in preparation for the 2020 and 21 school year, our school counseling curriculum has been updated to reflect the needs of SEL and social emotional instruction within the virtual environment. Areas of trauma associated with recent current events including COVID-19 and other areas and in, in, including social injustice and or racism. This infusion of trauma-informed care and social emotional learning will appear in the first school counseling classroom lesson of the year for all students. It will be delivered and embedded throughout the school year. Again, it is important to note that school counselors will be working side by side with our teachers to offer those classroom counseling lessons and then they'll work with families around individual counseling and small group counseling, which of course will require consent. Our crisis response, response team and our crisis response counseling services will continue throughout the 2020-21 school year and include responding to the emergent needs of students. This delivery model will be virtual and be conducted within Google Meets. Um, it could take on the form of an email or a phone call as determined by the counselor, the parent and guardian, and other stakeholders invested in the student's well-being. Classroom teachers will also have daily class meetings with their homeroom classes and or their whole group classes. This will make sure our students stay connected to their friends and their classmates and even in departmentalized schools or schools where students are in our um, intermediate grades um, have a math teacher and or a literacy teacher. Additional class meetings will be conducted just to build that classroom community. Teachers will work with counselors and families regarding again any individual student social emotional concerns. Small group targeted instruction. Another area of concern just around how will students receive targeted supports um, throughout the 2021 school year. Our schools are equipped with providing students with small group instruction that will be provided to differentiate supports that will be in the form of acceleration and enrichment. In addition to the classroom teachers, special educators, our resource staff as it relates to advanced academics, Title I, targeted supports will be available to provide small group instruction, differentiated supports and targeted instruction in order to meet the needs of, of all of our students. Again, these were just some of the questions that came up as it relates to our elementary school schedules, but keep in mind that the elementary school day and the daily schedules, the instructional materials, the social emotional learning, and this notion around small group instruction have all come together and will be tailored with your student and your child in mind. At this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Roberts, who will give us a glimpse into middle and high school schedules. Thank you, Dr. Jones. As we advance to the next slide, uh, we received several questions, actually a couple dozen questions regarding the secondary schedule for specifically middle schools and high schools around options for flexibility 
um, in the schedule. So a little bit of background. Some community members asked for the background on how schools may have reached the decisions that they did. Um, the chosen schedule of the year and how that looks and how that will actually operate um, with the poor child as they engage um, beginning on uh, in September. The spring refresher. Um, particularly around advanced placement students and what will happen for students who, re when they received their schedules last week, saw that they had advanced placement courses um, in the fall. Um, so we'll touch upon some of those points in this section. And then also around the operating hours. That one is pretty straightforward. You heard a little bit earlier, Dr. Jones mentioned for our elementary students, um, their operating hours, still a seven hour day, but that will operate between eight and four um, to provide our elementary schools who, who have a, um, some unique situations in terms of their instructional um, needs and wants for their students, um, provide them a little bit broader time and, and certainly in more alignment with their regular school day, but with our middle schools and high schools um, operating between that eight and three time frame um, across all of our middle and high schools. So going back, to the top. Um, we received questions around options for flexibility. Again, Dr. Jones mentioned in the reopening plan, um, it is very specifically mentioned um, around flexibility. Um, we're, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. And as all of you know that, that pre has presented all of us um, as educators within your own business communities and your own jobs and certainly within our homes, um, certainly challenges that for many of us we've never faced before. Um, so really key in our reopening plan and choosing and choosing options for virtual meeting schedules is really flexibility. So our principle started with that premise around what are some flexible options for us for our virtual meeting schedule because we know that our principals, our school building leaders, and our school building staff know their school communities the best. Um, they work with your children every day. Um, in almost all, in all of our schools, we have staff in the, who've been in those schools for years, if not decades. So we rely on our school-based staff and our school-based leadership to really give them the autonomy to say, um, being flexible, knowing your community, what do you feel is gonna work best for your community? So with that, our secondary schedules really came around um, about four or five different types of schedules that our secondary principals and our secondary schools had the option to choose from. So those are, are or were a four period A day B day, a four period semesterized schedule, a seven period A day B day. Um, some schools chose a seven period straight schedule. Um, and I'll uh, explain a little bit more in detail for each of these to give you some examples of what a student schedule may look like for each of these and an eight period straight schedule. So if we go back to a four period A day B day, whether at a middle school um, or a high school. So for a student in a four period A day B day, what that means is they're gonna take um, four classes on one day, let's say an A day and four different classes on the next day or the B day. So in total, over the course of two days, that student is taking eight classes. They're taking four on one day on the A day and four on a B day. Um, so they would go and what you see when you've seen your child's schedules, it may say on their schedule, quarter one, quarter two, or S1, quarter one, quarter two, and then may say uh, US government if they're a freshman. Um, and then S1, quarter one, quarter two, algebra one. Um, so that would signify semester one, which is made up of quarter one and quarter two, which takes us through the end of January. So your child may go through, and this is, and this next step is really where a principal who, who's moving forward or a school that's moving forward with a four period A day, B day may now, if you remember the puzzle pieces that, that I was explaining to you um, about 20 minutes ago, this is where those really puzzle pieces come in. This is where another option for flexibility comes in. What we will see across um, our school system, children may start the day with a social emotional component, with connection activity. It may be an avid class. It may be um, a, a, a circle where they would come together virtually in a, in a group circle just to unpack how are you feeling, how are you doing today, and then spend maybe 15, 20 minutes of that time before diving into or jumping into instruction. Some schools may start the day right at eight o'clock in period one, which is what many of our students are accustomed to at the secondary level. They come in and that, that um, virtual kind of bell rings, but eight o'clock comes and they start instruction right there. And then at 8.50, um, they would have a transitional break and they go right into period two. 
So the ind this is where the independent work now comes into play. So what some what you may see with some of your children's schedules where they may start the day in independent work. Let's say from 8 to 8.30, they're in independent work. Maybe it gives them time to prepare for the day, gives them time to refresh on some lessons before they start the day, and then they go into period one. Um, you may see on your child's schedule where they start in period one um, for maybe 30 or 40 minutes, but then they have independent time, and then they come back together as a class to wrap up that period. Um, so really, there's a lot of different options that our schools had in order to build or to put the, the puzzle pieces together to make sure based on what they're already accustomed to within that particular building um, or in this virtual environment, certainly with, with what is going on with COVID-19 in our virtual environment, to provide that academic support, to provide that increase of rigor and in live instruction, but also to provide that independent time for students to um, turn away from the computer or, or, or to start doing some independent work on their own before they jump back into their second period class. So as the students, as your child progresses through the day at the secondary level, you may find that they have um, one or two classes back to back, or they may have a class independent time and then another class, and then they have lunch. Um, so the lunch times um, may be a little bit um, earlier in the morning or later, 10, 11 o'clock, um, or they may be a little bit later. So again, akin to what um, they would have been accustomed to had they been going into school. So that's where our schools, again, had another opportunity for flexibility in building in the independent time and mixing that in with their regular instructional periods, as well as providing time for lunch. Um, and then as we, uh, Dr. Jones and Mrs. Byers unpacked for you a little bit earlier, the idea around movement breaks for our youngest learners, um, the movement breaks and the opportunities um, to, to have those times away um, before they come back into class. So another option that you see um, that we've gone over is the four by four semester period. So a variation of the four period A, D, A day, B day, but in a semesterized four, call it a four, you might have heard it called a four by four uh, or a four by four semester schedule. A student who is participating in a four by four, or if your school um, is moving forward with the four by four virtual meeting schedule, those students will only take four classes during the entire semester. So whereas in a four period A day, B day, it's they're taking eight classes all year or one day, four different ones the next. In a semesterized schedule, they're taking four classes from September through January. And then at the beginning of the third quarter, semester two, which is uh, quarters three and four, they are now taking four different courses for the second part of the year or for the second semester. However, the independent time in the insertion of lunch periods and independent time works exactly the same as it does for an A-day, B-day schedule. That's where schools, again, uh, schools operating in a semesterized schedule have that flexibility to say, well, we're going to have period one, but we may insert some independent time in the middle of that period one and then bring the kids back together to finish the period. Or we may insert independent time between periods one and two or two and three, or we may have periods one and two then independent time and lunch, maybe provide a larger break in the middle of the day, late morning, early afternoon, and then come back for periods three and four for the early afternoon until the end of the day at three o'clock. So you will see in your child's schedule um, variations on this theme. Um, and again, knowing that our school leaders and our school staff know their school's communities the best, um, we wanted to provide the maximum flexibility for them to build that schedule. So. The last or another example would be a seven period. Um, this you'll see in some of our high schools and it, primarily in our middle schools, but certainly some of our um, our high schools also moving forward in a seven period A day B day rotation. Um, what you'll see with the seven period A day B ro rotation is very similar to a four period A day B day rotation, for the exception that it's a seven period um, schedule. Students take instead of eight periods are going to take seven periods. So you may see on your child's schedule on Monday where they have periods one, two, three, and four. Again, they may have a college and career readiness course or a specialized middle school elective that maybe they start the day with. And then they have periods one and two. Um, and then they'll have lunch. And then that might be backed up against some independent small group time um, for them to work before they come back and log in and check in to their periods and, and engage in their period three and four class. 
And then coming in on Tuesday, which would be a B-day, that's where they would have their periods, um, the remainder of their periods, and then they'll repeat that cycle again. So they would have those seven period um, classes, the majority of those seven period classes all year, for the exception of some of our middle school electives, um, and even high school where we have electives that only run, or courses that only run for a semester. Um, but the bulk of their periods would run all year. So again, the flexibility around independent time, lunch time, um, and the opportunity to build that virtual meeting schedule to meet the needs of the students within a particular school community. Um, so a seven period and eight period, as I was mentioning earlier, kind of straight schedule, that is, um, that is exactly what it sounds like. Students in schools that are taking seven periods a day will take seven different classes a day. Now those periods are a little bit shorter, oh, excuse me, are a little bit shorter. Um, obviously then a four period day um, student would encounter. However, um, they have all their classes every day, Monday, every day, Tuesday, and every day Thursday, as we mentioned the schedule a little bit earlier. A period would also be the same. So again, these are done and those decisions were made um, based on the program offerings at the school, based on what particular um, offerings or magnet programs or, or whatever the situation presents itself at that school, then that school community chose the option that they felt was best for their students to, as we work through and get through this global pandemic. So now I wanna share a little bit around some responses to common community secondary virtual meeting questions. So we received a lot of questions around, um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, around AP classes. So in a semester I schedule, as I mentioned, a student who's taking AP government, as an example, in the first semester at a high school will finish that AP course in January. So we did receive several questions around, well, what happens between January, the end of January, until AP exams begin in May? So it's a great question, um, and one that our schools and our teachers and our administrators are certainly prepared um, to, to work with and support our students. For example, students who finish AP government um, or any AP course at the end of January, they will proceed and start with the second set of classes in February um, or at the beginning of the third quarter. However, what all AP teachers know and, and understand is that as they get into roughly late March or April, they begin review sessions. So what we expect is for students who took AP classes in the first semester, those students will be reached out to. And they'll be kind of the arm. You know, the school will wrap its arms around these students again um, as we get into the review period for AP exams and those students, the, the school leadership will work with the teachers and the teachers will all work together to bring those students kind of back into the fold for review sessions. And that may look different at every school. Some schools may operate review sessions that they may be able to build into a student's schedule. Um, some schools may operate um, review sessions that occur at other times throughout the day. It may be a, a combination of providing resources for their students. Um, so it really is a combination of factors that every school will engage in to make sure that students who finish their AP courses in January will have an opportunity um, to refresh that material, to engage in um, review sessions that students who are participating in, in that same AP course in the second semester will have um, to make sure that all students have the same opportunity uh, for success as they engage in their respective AP exams. Um, so that was one of, the, again, one of the major questions that was asked several times. We wanted to make sure we took time to address that. Um, some other last points uh, before we really go into the, the concluding slide is um, there were questions around feeder patterns. Why don't schools within a feeder pattern have the exact same schedule? So really, in short, um, building an exact same schedule, as you've heard the complexity from Dr. Jones and Mrs. Byers, and now th this portion with high schools, it's really not feasible to have a, a kindergartner on the exact same schedule as a 12th grader or a third grader on the exact same schedule as a 10th grader. The courses are different, the requirements are different, the credit requirements are different, the demands are, are different. Um, so with that, that's why each school had that opportunity and that flexibility versus an entire feeder pattern um, of students or within a feeder pattern having the same schedule. Um, we talked about the time for secondary schools between being between eight and three. Um, and then lastly, um, we talked about some, there were questions around going back to that semesterized schedule and knowing that 
uh, kind of why would a school choose that? Well, and some of the reasons um, that we wanted to lay out for the community was really the semesterized schedule does provide an opportunity, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, to provide students really with a focus on four classes. We know the, the global pandemic has, has caused a lot of stress um, on all of us as adults, but certainly on our children. And whether you're 17-year-old, 7-year-old, uh, or 5-year-old, or 4-year-old entering elementary school, um, we know that the stresses are are significant in some cases. Um, so we wanted to really make sure in the semesterized schedule for our secondary kids allows that opportunity to focus on um, those four classes. So that was just one reason um, that some of our schools decided to go in that direction. One of many reasons they decided, but we wanted to um, provide just an example for you because that was a question that was shared um, in the feedback from the community. So with that, um, it is 346 um, according to, to our time. So we're going to now kind of turn it back to Mr. Burke. We probably have um, probably about 10 minutes or so. So if Mr. Burke, um, we believe he's just going to run through, may have already selected a couple questions for Mrs. Byers, Dr. Jones, and I um, to give a response to kind of in live session here to wrap us up and close out the session. So, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Um, Mrs. Byers, Dr. Jones, and Dr. Roberts, I'm going to ask each of you two questions just to keep continuity uh, for the speaker so we don't have to jump back and forth. But certainly, if the expertise for the answer lies in one of your colleagues, please jump in and provide support. The questions are varied. Uh, so Mrs. Byers, the first question uh, really asks about um, the timeline for reevaluating how long we will be in virtual learning. Could you speak uh, to that timeline in the reopening plan? It mentions uh, January, to, um, the, the end of the semester in January. Uh, could you speak to the flexibility in that, please? Yes. So. Um if we go back to that window in December, uh, as it states in the reopening plan, our goal is uh, between September, uh, excuse me, excuse me, December 1st and December 15th, our goal is to be able to, at that time, have a sense of whether or not we will be able to, in a safe and healthy way, um, reopen to some extent in the spring. And so we will be looking at options for families for that second semester. Um, all of these decisions and our flexibility around these decisions is made in consultation with the health department. And so we work hand in hand with our health department to help inform timelines and windows um, around that flexibility. And so our hope, as is explained in the reopening plan, our hope is that beginning in December, if all is going well, we are flattening the curve, as we like to say, we will be able to ask families to begin planning for that second semester. And at that time, those options for our families would be hybrid, meaning part of the, day, uh, part of the week students would be cohorted and be able to go to school face-to-face, -face, um, whereas part of the week they would be in a virtual learning environment. Um, or our families would be able to choose because of their individual circumstance as a family, be able to choose to continue uh, virtual learning for the remainder of the school year. So again, working in consultation with the health department, uh, we are hoping that we will be able to make some of those decisions. Thank you, Mrs. Byers. The next question is really two questions that I'd hope you'd answer. Uh, there was a question that, uh, what about AVID? Will that program still take place? And then the second question I'd like you to respond to asked, um, in your presentation, you talked about grades one through four. Uh, there was a question, what about grade five? Um, is, there, is there a difference in that information? So if, if you could answer those two questions, please. Absolutely. So yes, AVID. Um, any student who is currently enrolled in AVID at the middle or high school level will continue to have AVID through their virtual learning. Um, regardless of the scheduling model that a school has selected for their virtual meeting schedule, because a student is enrolled in the AVID class, they will have um, 
synchronous live instruction for us. I do want to take a moment in the event that any of our families um, participating in this conversation are elementary parents who have students in one of our elementary schools that does have AVID. Um, if you fall into that category, please know that schools will continue to incorporate AVID strategies in learning with students. So at the elementary level, um, much of our AVID curriculum is really around executive functioning and helping our youngest learners um, learn how to organize themselves as a learner. And it is infused in their daily instruction. And so for our elementary schools who are part of the AVID program, those students will continue to have those strategies, those executive functioning strategies infused into their regular lessons. With regard to our grade five students, and um, as a former fifth grade uh, teacher, um, you may know that fifth graders are unique. They are unique in that they are preparing for a big transition into sixth grade. So let me start with what uh, the components of their instructional day might um, be. The components will be the same. So your fifth grader can anticipate both synchronous live instruction and asynchronous learning through independent work. Many of our elementary schools, however, do choose what we would call a departmentalization model, where our fifth grade students have a different teacher based on content. So for example, they have a teacher for mathematics, a teacher for English language arts. In some instances, our students have a writing teacher and a reading teacher. And um, our elementary schools choose those models to help our fifth graders prepare for that transition to middle school. And so when you receive your fifth graders individual virtual meeting schedule, you may see some of those nuances for our fifth grade students. So that again, we're mirroring what they might experience in the brick and mortar setting in a virtual environment so that we can provide that support in that transitional grade. But I just want to emphasize that the components of their day will mirror those of um, the other grades at the elementary level. They will have that live instruction, they will have small group instruction, whole group instruction, and then they also will have that independent time. I hope that answered those questions, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Mrs. Byers, it absolutely did. Dr. Jones, I'm gonna consolidate a number of questions and paraphrase sure. uh, what I think parents are, are asking. There have been quite a number of questions about the attendance policy and about grading. Specifically, how will attendance be taken at the elementary and high school level? And if a child shows up late later in the day, will that attendance count uh, for the day? And then around grading, Will we stay pass fail or will children receive letter grades? If you could speak about those two areas, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Burke, I'd be happy to. So um, within our sco school reopening plan, we have outlined daily attendance procedures that will take place during our virtual learning and throughout the fall semester. Um, for elementary sc school students, students will receive and or have their attendance taken um, with their teacher doing whole group instruction, the homeroom teacher or the teacher of the student will call the roll during the first scheduled Google Meet and in, attendance will be taken in the morning and in the afternoon. Because we know that we're virtual and we realize that families are balancing work, career, life, and of course family, we wanna make sure that we capture the student's attendance. So there will be multiple opportunities um, throughout the day in the morning and the afternoon to capture elementary attendance. As it relates to middle and high school and or secondary attendance, um, as students log in for their first uh, class of the day, the during each meeting period or during each class, role will be taken or the attendance will be taken so that students will receive um, attendance credit and or access to learning for each for each class. So throughout the fall for secondary students will receive course attendance, 
to make sure that each class that they are attending is is actually captured. Um, as it relates to Wednesdays and in terms of attendance, students will receive um, attendance and or um, credit for participating in virtual learning as they log on and complete asynchronous assignments, as they meet with their teachers independently, and or um, as assignments are submitted throughout Schoology. So that's um, kind of the plan for attendance. Um, students will be held harmless as it relates to attendance if it is not captured in the morning and it is captured in the afternoon, that attendance will count for the students because we know that we are using the internet and we're using technology and so there will be allowances made for attendance. Now, if a student should be absent for the day from instruction because of a doctor's appointment or any um, excusable absence, we still should consider those best practices of communicating with the school and making sure that the school is aware of the student's absence so that we can fill um, our students in on what is missed and actually capture their attendance. As it relates to grading, we will be following the um, grading and reporting policy as outlined in our um, BCPS uh, policy and rule. So the, um, the continuity of learning grading that took place during our emergency shutdown will not take place in the fall we will move back to standard practices for grading and reporting. And all of those practices will be shared and outlined as our schools host um, orientation, transition meetings, meetings with our schools, and of course, any type of back to school nights. Thank you, Mr. Burke. I hope that answers some of the question. It did, thank you so much. And Dr. Roberts, two quick questions for you about devices, and then I'll, I'll leave it to you to uh, bring us to a close. Um, uh, we, I had quite a few questions about will students keep their devices that they have or will all be or, or will all students be issued a new device and speaking of new how will new students get their devices okay so thank you mr. Burke so uh, our students do have them from the continuity of learning so not all students will get new devices they will and instructions will be coming home if they haven't already been sent home to the communities around students who have devices um, will when they go for their instructional students parents will be receiving instructions from their schools um, around instructional material pickup um, so there will be directions coming from your schools um, from your principals on days on a, on a time where similar to at the end of the year the continuity of learning in the springtime where you as parents um, or students went to the school to drop off materials that will happen almost in reverse where there will be a time um, over these next two weeks where students will be able to go um, and pick up materials and then again with directions um, on how to, when they bring their device to um, refresh it is the term, to really make sure it's uploaded with the uh, newest software, with the newest safety protocols and the information that needs to be on that device to get them properly prepared, um, which really goes into that sec second question, Mr. Burke, around students who are new to Baltimore County Public Schools um, who are or enroll in Baltimore County Public Schools will get a new device again, and those devices will be issued when they come up to pick up their materials, um, those devices will be issued to them when, when they report to school so they're prepared for online instruction um, in early September. So I hope that answers uh, those quick answers for two quick questions. Um, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, as Mr. Burke mentioned, um, we are coming up on our time. Um, and I'm glad that certainly from Dr. Jones and Mrs. Byers and I, um, certainly glad that we were able to answer um, a few questions in live time from the questions that were shared with us in the chat room. But again, we do want to be mindful and respectful of your time as a community um, that we have reached this hour. But want to reassure you that this is really just the beginning of our reopening conversation. Um, we will continue to communicate uh, through our advisory stakeholder groups throughout the year. There are several um, standing stakeholder advisory groups um, in Baltimore County Public Schools that we um, work in partnership with to communicate information um, out to the community, but also receive feedback from the community. Um, and as a reminder, or if you're not aware that this Thursday, August 27th, uh, two events, two similar events will occur. Um, first will be a bilingual English Spanish event at 11.30 a.m. Um, and that presentation will go over some of these same um, questions um, 
But again, it'll be a bilingual English-Spanish event, and that can be found on the Somos Baltimore Latino Facebook page. Um, and we will also offer a second round of this community conversation from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, so all the information around the bilingual uh, English-Spanish event, as well as the second community conversation um, from 6 to 7 p.m., both this Thursday, are readily available. All the details are readily available on the bcps.org webpage. So in conclusion, please be sure to check out um, our reopen page for continual updates as that page is updated continually with the newest information as we'll be staying in touch with your child's school. Um, also, some of you, as we look through the chat, had specific questions about your child's, whether it be schedule or not receiving it yet. Um, I know that, thank you to our colleagues who are providing answers to that. You can always certainly reach out to your school for, for any school specific information. So on behalf of, again, Dr. Jones, uh, Mrs. Byers, on behalf of Dr. Williams, our superintendent, and all of our cabinet colleagues and colleagues who are on this chat, we want to thank our community for taking time, uh, taking this hour to spend with us. We certainly appreciate your time um, and are very appreciative of your continued support of Baltimore County Public Schools. So with that, we will conclude and we wish all of you well. Thank you.